the phones actually couldn't hold more than that amount of money, and so they had like a flag that says, hey, if any phone company ever says you've inserted like $300, send the police immediately to investigate that payphone. Um, I've never heard of that. Like hey guys, so you know that I'm a bit of a phone freak, if not for the fact that I have like eight videos on my channel with the word phone freaking in the title, and the fact that you've seen me build all of my phone systems, but... I'm a big fan of the 8-Bit guy, and he made a video uh, that was published today. Um, he actually did a talk at the Seattle Retro, whatever the fuck, convention in Seattle. And uh, he did a talk about how telephone freaking worked. And I started to cringe a little, because there's a lot of oversimplifications he made that I want to correct, because I think some of the stuff he got wrong is actually the most awesome part of phone freaking. So I want to address a lot of the things that David kind of glossed over or oversimplified. I don't want to sit here and say David is wrong on a lot of things because I doubt either one of us were alive during the, the peak of phone freaking. I do want to clarify a lot of the technical points uh, that he brought forward and make a couple quick corrections. Well, first of all, he titled the video How Telephone Freaking Worked and I don't know anyone that says telephone freaking. It's called phone freaking because it's alliteration. And in fact, phone freaks back in the day, which was a whole class of people, um, very much like how hackers today use lead speak, a lot of phone freaks back then used the PH prefix on a lot of words just as a tongue in cheek, like fun or federal or fidelity. You'd be a phone freak if you were a tinkerer that liked to discover things with the phone. There's a lot of phone freaking you can do without breaking the law, without using a blue box, without getting free long distance calls. Getting free long distance calls was just the mainstream reason people phone freaked. Phone freaking was more like spelunking in the phone system. It was like, hey, I'm really interested in the system, I want to find out how it works. But then the media focused primarily on the negative aspects of it, the illegal aspects of it, whatever the fuck. Another clarification is that he equates trunk lines to long distance, but trunk lines go between any two central offices, any two offices that have switching equipment that people's phones come back to. If you're calling someone in another part of a large city, you're probably going through a trunk line even though there's no long distance. Not only might you be going through a trunk line if you're making a local phone call, but you might be going through a trunk line even if you're calling someone else in the same exact central office. If you're calling someone in a different switch in the same building, you're going through a trunk line. A trunk line is any shared line between two central office switches. It's not necessarily the same as long distance. In order for something to be long distance, you're going through either a toll tandem or a message accounting system that's actually keeping track of what calls you're making so that they can bill you later. Blue boxing and long distance often Often go together because the primary reason that normal everyday people use blue boxes is to get long distance calls but there's a ton of phone freaking that can be done with a blue box that has nothing to do with long distance Another quick correction is that 2600 Hertz is not the dial tone or ready tone, which is a term I've never heard before. 2600 Hertz is used as what's called a supervisory tone. It's not just a tone that signifies to the other side that it's ready to receive digits. It's actually a tone that's there all the time whenever that side of the phone connection is hung up. And in fact, the 2600 Hertz is superimposed over the call. In fact, like for example, if this was the 1970s and I made a long distance call or an any call that went through a 2600 hertz trunk, um, 2600 hertz would be coming at you from the far side all the way up until that person picked up the phone. So through connection, through the of waiting for that, you would be getting 2600 hertz in your direction. And the only reason why you wouldn't hear it is because there'd be a notch filter filtering it out. So it's not really just like a tone, like a dial tone that signifies that, you know, the equipment's in a specific state. It is actually the audio equivalent of that phone being on hook or hung up. The other thing is that 2600 hertz would go in both directions. So if you have an idle trunk line that's not being used on either end, you have 2600 hertz blaring in both directions at the same time. And when one central office picks up that trunk, it goes off hook and the 2600 stops. The other side acknowledges that you're off hook by doing a wink. It stops 2600 hertz for a split second and then it puts it back on. And you would actually hear this on your end as like a kerchink because the notch filter would take a split second to kick in and, and the audio would bleed out of frequency for a split second. I'm on the highway now. I have a seatbelt on. Leave a comment. Another thing he gets wrong is in DTMF, aka Touchtone, the ABCD keys 
were not on older phones. There were no consumer phones made with an ABCD key. In fact, the earliest phones that actually had touchtone didn't have a star or a pound key. And when the military used the ABCD tones, they weren't called ABCD. They had specific abbreviations because they had specific functions in the Autobahn network that they were used in. They were used for call prioritization. Here's an example of what a military phone actually looked like that had these keys. He also noted that back then the only reason why you would ever dial an area code is if you're making a long distance phone call. And just like today, that really all depends on where you were. There were plenty of scenarios where you didn't have to dial all 10 digits to make a long distance call, especially if you were making a long distance call somewhere within the same region. Likewise, there are a number of places and situations where you would have to dial an area code, even if you weren't making a long distance call. Think about the case where there's two small towns next to each other and they're in different area codes. Well, just because in different area codes doesn't necessarily mean that they're long distance and in a lot of cases you can get by with seven digit dialing but it really all depended on the dialing plan of that area and what numbers you would dial if there was any ambiguity in the exchange then you would have to dial an area code even if it wasn't going to charge you money even if it didn't go through a toll tandem or a camera system or something that was actually going to show up on your bill but the rules were not universal across the country it really all depended on where you were what you were calling and really not so much to do with whether it was long distance or not there were many situations where if it was long distance you would have to dial a one first even if it was a seven digit number but that is not necessarily the same as you you being required required to dial 10 digits if it's long distance and seven digits if it's not. If you lived in Tarrant County, where I did, we had the uh, area code of, of 817. And if you lived in Dallas County, then it was 214. So fun piece of trivia, the original area codes, the second digit of every area code was either a one or a zero. And the area codes were assigned from lowest to highest, from most populated to least populated. Like New York 212, Los Angeles 213, Philadelphia 215 would take the least amount of time to dial on a rotary phone. And exchange codes, in other words, the, the next three digits of the phone number would never have a zero or a one in the middle position. This effectively meant that the equipment could tell the difference between the beginning of an area code and the beginning of an exchange code. Or something, but for some bizarre reason, it was like four or five times more expensive to call between these two counties than to make. So if you want more background on the idiosyncrasies and the unintuitivities of the way the phone company charged you, click this link. It goes to a, a tape by Evan Doorbell, who is a, a, one of the original phone freaks who recorded a huge amount of 1970s and 1980s phone recordings specifically for posterity because he knew, he had the foresight that digital technology would wipe out all of the electromechanical shit that made all the cool sounds, that let him explore, that did all that stuff. I highly suggest you listen to this series called How I Became a Phone Freak by Evan Doorbell. It's a really awesome story and he uses actual phone recordings from the era. You can actually hear what this stuff sounded like and kind of get an idea from a, a layperson's perspective as to why this actually was really interesting and why phone freaking is about a lot more than just making free calls or hacksering the telephone network. So you knew if you saw a telephone number uh, you could actually narrow down almost like a zip code you could narrow down a particular geographic area where that telephone number was for for most intents and purposes that's correct the the prefix aka the exchange code aka the nxx um, was typically confined to a specific geographic area, but not because, uh, like, uh, like a zip code where they, they made a border. The, the exchange code is actually what telephone switch you were actually reaching. And it was possible through something called foreign exchange lines to actually have a, a prefix from far away if you really wanted to. Today we don't bat an eye because we have a number portability. You can have a phone number from California in New York and we have cell phones. You can go anywhere and have the same phone number. But even back then, it, it was all all about where your phone line actually terminated. It had nothing to do with the geographic area. Telephone books would have um, maps that kind of help people understand where they were calling because they wanted to make sure that they weren't, you know, going to get charged out the ass. But it actually was more about where those lines terminated and how they both logically and more importantly physically delineated and and 
designed the numbering plan. So all you would have to figure out is the line number, which is the last four digits. So there's still 10,000 combinations, but how could you narrow that down? So it actually isn't really 10,000 combinations for a couple of reasons. First of all, line numbers that began with 99, for example, 9901, 9952, whatever, were typically reserved for official use. Either test lines or lines actually within the switch, lines within the phone company. And then also the 9000 series phone numbers were typically reserved for pay phones in locations that had pay phones. Also, COs typically did not assign subscribers, or at least regular subscribers, line numbers that began with zero or double zero, whatever. You can put, but for the most part, as a side effect of how the phone system used to operate back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, the, the phone number was actually physically mapped out on equipment. If your phone number was like 2345, you would go through a, a, a selector for all phone numbers beginning with a 2, followed by equipment that was there for all phone numbers beginning with 2-3, and then you'd hit a connector switch, and then the 4-5 actually uh, mapped to an X and a Y position in a 2-D switch of contacts. So even though today we think of phone numbers as logical things that can just be assigned at will or changed at will, back then these phone numbers actually had physical meaning, very much like your street address. And they had to plan very carefully when they needed to change or add or remove numbers from this equation. The, when they call it a blue box, it's because back then they actually had to construct a box back in the 70s to do this kind of stuff. And there were all these different kinds of boxes. So actually, some of the earliest phone freaks would use electronic synthesizers, tape recorders, a, a, a wildly creative variety of ways to create these tones without actually building a box that they could bring to a payphone. It's really just more of the, I wouldn't call them commercial, but more of the mainstream blue boxes that were used by the mob and just ordinary people that wanted free phone calls that were actually constructed in like a small box and the first people that made these for actual sale were Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs of Apple. Steve Wozniak actually designed an amazing blue box which I think is on display at the Telephone Museum of XYZ, I don't really know. But you didn't just have to have a, a blue box for this, there was a number of ways you could, you could do this. Including just recording the tones that the phone system automatically made when you dialed legitimate phone numbers and just cutting that tape around and playing them back take a red box and take it to a payphone and just hold it up to the microphone and, you know, push the button and it would create the sounds for quarters. This is correct and red boxes actually worked all the way up through the 90s and even through the 2000s. Put more than $200 in fake quarters in the payphone, uh, they would immediately send the police to investigate because the phones actually couldn't hold more than that amount of money and so they had like a flag that says, hey, if any phone company ever says you've inserted like $300, send the police immediately to investigate that payphone. Uh, um, I've never heard so of that. be a little that. bit careful how much money you told that you, you were putting in there. Um, I've never heard of that. that. So... The silver box adds... I've never heard of that. Payphone circuits um, actually didn't even keep track of how much money you told the phone network you put in the phone. They wouldn't really know how much money the phone made until they would actually come and collect it. Um, there were ways of tracking this, but... In a huge majority of the case, at least in the 70s, there was nothing there that was counting up how much money was in the phone at the CO. The, the tone was literally just to satisfy an automatic circuit that just checked to make sure that you actually paid for the call. It wasn't like making a long distance call where some billing equipment actually sat there and tabulated how many quarters someone put in the phone. I'm pretty sure that that's actually not the case, um, but if you know of otherwise, please make a comment below and, and school me. School this kitty on phones, please. I really want someone to teach me new shit about the 1970s phone network. I have listened to all recordings that I can get my hands on. Yo, oh, we used to sit around campfires and talk about this or that. Well, you know, us hackers, when we were 12, we'd sit around campfires and talk about building blotto boxes. And we believed, seriously believed this actually existed, although we found out later it was it was just a hoax, it was mythical, didn't really exist. But the, the only time I've ever heard reference to a blotto box outside of tongue-in-cheek references by other phone freaks is in a text files article um, that you can find on textfiles.com that listed the various types of boxes. Um, so I don't, I don't really think that that was a thing ever. Now, with that said, there was something called juicing, 
where you could actually reset relays in your phone company's switch by sending 120 volts AC down the line. And that's something that Evan Doorbell does on one of his tapes. You did get some interesting things back in the day by hooking your line up to uh, electrical current. Um, it's not like today where you will probably damage everything in your house. With that said, public service announcement, do not hook your phone line up to 120 volts AC. Do not do it. Do, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And what you would do is uh, if you had one of these cards, um, you would call a local number or a 1-800 number and then it would a little record. Oh no, he's talking about phone cards now. This might just be my subjective opinion, but phone card fraud is not phone freaking. I'm gonna show you the blue box. This is one we talked about at the very beginning where we did the 1-800 the number and then the 2600 hertz tone on the trunk line. And so you could do this all from your computer. So one thing that would get you caught is if you blue box to an 800 number because after the phone company realized that blue boxing was a thing and that regular people were buying these blue boxes, they would look for really long calls to 1-800 numbers. 800 numbers they did have to log and, and audit because when you make an 800 number, even though it's free for you, the company whose number it is is actually getting charged. So if you made like a three hour call to like a, an automated movie hotline, they would know that like something was up. Or if you made like a three hour call to any 800 number that wasn't actually in service, they would know something's up. So making a call to an 800 number to begin your blue boxing effort is not recommended. You actually don't even need a modem to use this program. Uh, what you could actually do is take the handset for your telephone and hold it up to your monitor or television screen or whatever right next to the speaker. And um, it would dial the number and then it would wait. Uh, that sounds really bad. You would press enter. There's your telephone. Oh my God. So and now I've got a free telephone call to wherever it is that I wanted. <laughs> it was that easy. Okay, so, so real quick, the only tone there that actually sounded correct other than the 2600 hertz was the key pulse tone, which is that, that loud one. I have no idea why the key pulse that that program generated was so much louder than the other tones, but that did not sound... Now, now, don't get me wrong, those tones probably did work on the phone network because the tolerances on those tones, especially in the beginning, were really, really broad. But as they, they tried to combat freaking, they made the tolerances on those tones very, very tight. And uh, that may not work over your particular phone line. I mean, keep in mind, those tones have to go through an analog line. And if you're out in the sticks, there's a lot of noise on the line. The other thing, and again, this, this will work, but real MFs would be dialed a lot faster than that. I'm really curious why the program didn't dial the MFs a lot quicker, like this. That's what I would expect it to sound like if the if the Commodore program was actually trying to mimic the phone switch. Because near the end of the blue boxing era, there were several projects, like Project Green Star, that would actually try to home in on the nuances of things that blue boxers would do that were not network accurate and would log like for example the fact that you made a, a call with blue box tones uh, on a on a line that should not have blue box tones on it so that um, was probably a good way to get caught if you were actually using this in the 80s to make free phone calls i i wouldn't suggest you do this and like so here's the quarter tone the dime uh, the nickel and yeah, you could just record those like onto a cassette tape and then... So maybe they sound horrible because he's in an auditorium and he's giving a speech over a PA system, but those tones should sound a lot more like this. Five cents. 10 cents. 25 cents. And this is just an app you can get for free on Android called Tone Deaf. I have a lot of respect for the Apic guy. He has a lot of cool shit. He makes some really nice retro games like Planet X3. Um, but it sounds like this presentation was spurred by him discovering this Commodore program and wanting to explain it in depth. And for the everyday person, this is actually a pretty decent presentation. You really don't have a lot of people talking about blue boxing and phone freaking these days. But I just want to clarify some of the, some of the things that made me cringe about his presentation. I'm actually going to be developing a game way in the future when my current projects are done called Freaker. If you go to Freaker.com, that's P-H-R-E- akr.com 
there's a placeholder page there right now. But if you actually go there and you play with the uh, the, the numeric keypad on your keyboard while you're in the, the web page, um, you'll hear these blue box tones. You can actually use Freaker.com as a blue box. And this blue box is something I wrote entirely in JavaScript. So these are not WAV files that are being played back. These are actually tones that are being generated in JavaScript in real time. So take a look at that. I think it might be interesting. I also want to link you to a bunch of phone freaking resources in the doobly-doo, including evandorbell.com. Evan Doorbell was not a very well-known phone freak, but he is notorious for having recorded so much stuff, and he is a great storyteller. You really need to listen to this shit. In fact, I really regret not including his stuff in my 10 awesome things to do online video, because frankly, Listening to Evan's tapes has changed, I don't want to say changed my life, but it is definitely something that is really intriguing. This stuff was actually huge equipment and it, there were switches and coils and, and there was a lot of crosstalk. This was analog stuff and you would hear things, you would hear noises and clicks and you would hear the equipment operating to the point where you could actually understand what it was doing if you just listened carefully enough. That's why a lot of the early phone freaks were actually blind. They, they listened, they used the telephone a lot, and in using the telephone they heard all this stuff and they understood what was going on because it was predictable, it made sense. Probably didn't make sense for them at the time, but like they made sense of it. It was really cool shit. That's all I'm gonna say on the matter before I bore everyone else to death, but if you like this video, comment, subscribe, all that shit. And if you have money to throw away, I have a Patreon that you can sign up for. There's a public post on my Patreon that actually goes into why I created a Patreon. Um, I don't want to jump on the Patreon bandwagon, but I think uh, there's a lot of interesting benefits to having one other than getting money. Check that out. And uh, if you want more information about phone freaking, let me know what specifically interests you. I could sit here and rant for days about phone freaking, and I wasn't even alive during most of this good shit. Until next time, this is Nil signing off. And one last thing, if you're a subscriber to my channel, I hurt you.